Hello, I'm Craig Constantine. Hello, I'm Anna Schautzka. And hi everyone, I'm Monika Maschinoskaite. I guess we have to speak hi, more, right? Thank you ladies for... <laughs> no, it's golden. No, no. I, I mean, you can, you're more than welcome to. Um, one of the things I enjoy watching is the, there's like a, um, a relay race of, you know, like I say hello and then I can see when Anna hears me and then she's because like the, the delays show up, you know, but oh, yes. how amazing is it? Right. You, you got, are you both in Vienna? Monica, I know you're in Vienna. Where, uh, Anna, I'm where in Vienna and Anna in, is in some weird country, right? <laughs> which which no one goes to. <laughs> it's not <that> weird. <laughs> it's not because weird. I... And normally, the, normally it's the American who goes, where are you in some weird country? <laughs> Um, I, I don't know where Albania is. I'll, I'll just out myself, but I'll, I'll get a map. Oh, Albania um, is just just next to Greece. It's like I see Greece from my balcony, so it's like oh, so close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, it's, so you yeah. have the view, but you don't have the economic chaos. Nice place. Uh, I wouldn't be so sure about that. We have power outages on a regular basis, so um, oh. hopefully the power doesn't go out now, and you know, <laughs> I keep my Wi-Fi. <laughs> Um, so before, as if anybody listens to the show, you know, before we start recording, we talk a little bit. And when I asked you guys about podcasting, we headed off to talk about self-discovery or self-improvement. And I don't often hear podcasters talk about that. I know that um, podcasters are aware that podcasting is this journey of learning. Um, but I was surprised to hear Anna say that you're using it as a self. It really feels like a form of self-development for you. So when we start talking about podcasting, I love that you, I'll put words in your mouth. I love that you guys are using podcasting as a way to improve yourselves. So was there a point where you realized that you were podcasting and it was helping you improve or was it self-improvement from the very beginning? I think it's just uh, for me personally, it's just a change of mindset. So I just, uh, you know, started to listen to a lot of podcasts. And as we spoke before, I'm a little bit late to the party. So I've been discovering really this format since I think Monica, since since you started your open arted podcast and I actually started listening to it and I thought, oh, this is so, so cool. And I realized how much I'm learning. You know, after a few months, I realized I, I'm exposed to so many different worldviews and and so many different uh, aspects of um, people's lives and I just felt you know a big improvement in my mindset in everyday life yeah I thought about the, what we did during our piano phase project uh, and actually we decided to record every single day our process you know, we just had a discussion with Anna. I mean, it was not podcast uh, uh, format. It was vlogging, but uh, I still consider that we just talk, talked and it was live. And we would, um, so we did the project in five days. And uh, every day we played twice um, in the museum. It was like an installation. We played the same piece and we played it uh nine times in total oh, and people could uh, just uh, come in hmm. and uh, see us they could leave when they wanted basically we were just like an exhibition you know we were not a, a concert and uh, it was very interesting for us hmm. because we couldn't meet and 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 rehearse this piece it's a piano phase by steve reich american composer and uh, we just i think anna you came up with this idea that let's just um do a little vlog every day and see what happens. And I think we were for five or seven days, we were talking every day and we figured it, figured out so much. So I think for me, podcasting is about learning from myself, if I can say that. I don't know. <laughs> when, you know, I did uh, all the open arted episodes, I learned a lot about myself, what I, what I love in the profession in the classical music world because the, the podcast is about that but also i learned from others so yes again i came back to learning <laughs> did you so i just want to be like were you both in the space playing together right so you're you're physically playing in person yes, yes. so uh we are both classical 
And so we are both classical pianists uh, and uh, yeah, we came out with this project last year uh, and we, we performed it in Vilnius in the Mon Museum, which is a, a very, uh, very cool and a very well-known uh, contemporary arts museum in Lithuania. Uh, and uh, yeah, we just collaborate as two pianists, as a sort of piano duo. But although we are classical musicians, classical pianists, we want to use this opportunity to create music installation, which means we want to present a new format of a classical music uh, concert to the audience. So it's a liberal way of, of pre presenting it so people can move freely in the space, they can you know, interact with us uh, at all times. So um, that was really something, something new for us. I have two thoughts. One is, can you play while talking to someone else? Like if someone walks up to you and says, what are you playing or what are you doing? What do you have for lunch? Can you actually <laughs> continue to play a duet while like, does that work? <laughs> Cause I'm, that would be astounding. It's a, it's a very good question because I think it might work, but not with this piece because this piece is <laughs> like on one hand, it's, it's very easy. And for our skills as classical musicians, it's almost, you know, nothing to do. You could think like that. But then, because the thing is that we actually play only one little motive for 20 minutes. Okay, maybe two or three, but they are very similar. And we repeat them because this is like a minimalistic music. Uh, and the thing is that if you, if you lose your... It's, it's like a brain hack. I don't know. It's, since you are repeating the same thing... At some point, your brain shuts down, and then you are you don't really control anymore what you're doing. So you you even though it's easy to repeat the same thing, but if you are if you lose this flow, you can very easily kind of you know lose everything. So <laughs> it's actually quite complicated. That's interesting that you bring up. I was thinking it sounds like you're describing flow, and then you use the exact word. Um, I always. You guys haven't ever been on a recording with me. I go like this and I lock up because I have so many. I'm like, oh, I got 900 questions I want to ask, all these threads I want to pull on. Um, I was going to ask before I was thinking, I wonder what other opportunities have um, have appeared, like having done like a micro podcast project, a micro collaboration with each other. Um I wonder what I what other opportunities have arisen. So here, here's a twofer. Do you want to answer that question, or do you want to talk more about the flow state and what happens? Work, like I'm betting that if you work on a piece enough, you can get into the flow state just playing a solo. And how might that flow state of solo performance be different from flow state with a second person involved? So two completely different questions. <laughs> to which one do you want to answer? What opportunities have you found having done the project? And what about flow state solo versus duet with flow? I think it would be interesting to maybe talk about the opportunities that uh, cool. that go, came go, up go. with the project because that that was I think more more life changing. I think in terms of playing, whether we play solo or with uh, another person or with more people, it's ultimately probably a similar experience still. Hmm. So opportunities. Yeah, so I so think I wanted to... Uh, oh, sorry, Anna. <laughs> you go, you go. <laughs> no, 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 you say, you say. I just wanted to say um, that... So, uh... with opportunity... <laughs> I think there is I'm just sitting here watching like... you guys figure it out. <laughs> you go, Anna, Monica, you go. You go. Okay, I go first, and then I, I, I hand it over. Um, so... <laughs> This is funny. That's how, that's not how we play chamber music. Hopefully, we're more synchronized. Uh, <laughs> so I think basically, I don't know if it's about opportunities, but it's about the mindset that changed after uh, we organized and performed this music installation in Vilnius. Because I don't think we expected something in particular. I don't think we had something you know um, very concrete in mind. But um, it just opened our eyes to who our audience is, you know, young people were very interested. They came asking questions and, you know, we live in this sort of um, worldview that the young people are not interested in classical music, but it's not true. 
uh, it is just not accessible to them. So we just started to think how we can uh, make it more accessible. So we try to keep it, you know, free for the audience. And um, in order to do it, we also set up like a little fundraising page, which you can find on uh, monicapianista.com. If you go to this website, you'll be able to find the Piano Face project page and um, and the link to support us. So we can bring this project to more countries and perhaps even around the world and and keep it free and accessible to audiences of all backgrounds. Yeah, so I just wanted to add that, uh, you know, besides this uh, playing in the museum, as I said before, we actually talked a lot. And then the documentary, which we filmed during the project, consists of 20 minutes of interview between us, Anna and me, and then 20 minutes uh, of live playing. So this was like the last performance we did. And uh, half of the documentary, you can call it like that, is uh, about our uh, takeaways from that project. So I think, you know, by talking, we actually came up with a lot of ideas where we could go, what we could do, how could we connect with audience. So, yes, I can't remember the question, but I hope I answered it. (laughs) (laughs) Opportunities. Oh, well, because I asked like a really wacky two-part question, Um, but we were we were following the thread of opportunities and I've, I've heard of, I'm going to say a lot of people, not just podcasters, but a lot of people that I've talked to on my podcast, I've heard a lot of people say, I went to work on something and wow, I found all these other things. And I think there's a really, uh, I'm going to say amazing thing that happens when you, when you stop and talk to somebody else about, you know, I did this. And then they go, you did what? And then and like, when you begin to explain what you have done and why you did it and how you did it, the other person goes, Hey, that that's amazing. Or did you think about, you know, trying it on the other side or, you know, they, they, they offer you this mirror. So I think your, your point about, we did a documentary and we talked about it and you, you made the point about how much that surprised you and what you discovered. I've seen a lot of, and it's happened to me too, but I've seen that happen a lot. And I think that says something about maybe the opposite or the counterpoint to flow. Like when you're in the flow state, you can do a really good caliber of work. You can really, you know, do all the things that we know about flow, but there's something to be said for also finding somebody else who has the same understanding of the flow state in that same thing. So the conversation that two pianists have is going to be very different than, you know, like if I walk up and say, oh, that's really cool. Can you play Beethoven or something like, you know, you're not going to get the same type of self-discovery out of it. So we started at the very beginning talking about self-development and now we've gone to talk about flow and working together. And I'm, I'm wondering if you have any insights about if I try to develop myself through work, I'm going to have a certain kind of experience, a certain amount of a growth that I can achieve. But if I'm able to find somebody else who's maybe we say on the same journey or who's got the same passion, um, if you have any insights about the difference between like working at a mastery level on your own and working on a mastery level with somebody who's got the same uh, passion, uh, have you ever thought about the difference in that kind of solo versus duet? I'm watching them decide who's answering. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I go. Okay, I will, like, I will, what's I will. the pregnant silence? <laughs> you go, Monica. Rock, you go. rock, paper, scissors for it? Uh, I think it's a super interesting point you touch because, you know, there are thousands of pianists on this planet, in this planet. <laughs> and uh, really, I think we have this flow with Anna. And it's so funny because we we actually met very accidentally but uh playing wise it was kind of clear since the beginning that uh, it works for us we have a same touch we have same breathing but uh once we started uh doing these vlogs and then the interview which you will see in the documentary something really weird happened because like i would never have courage 
to say things which I have courage to say when I'm with Anna. And the, mm. somehow the conversation just flows. And then, you know, we, we actually discover new levels of, I don't know, philosophy or whatever. But somehow we, we become uh, uh, courageous together much more when we are alone. And some things I could just, I think I could never pull it off if I wouldn't be with Anna. So that's my point of view. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, pulling off is actually a, a good way to to put it in a way that I feel I feel the same way. And I'm actually discovering it, um, you know, in the recent weeks and months more and more that um, I think uh, I always try to do things on my own. And, and, you know, also as a classical pianist, you know, they always tell you you have to be a soloist, um, all of that. Uh, so you're inevitably, you know, practicing on your own, trying to achieve things on your own. But as a team, there is just so much more you can do because I think ultimately someone's just got your back and you're not mm. afraid of rejection because there is always this other person or persons that are in the project with you. So you're, just, you're not afraid of, of rejection, of failure, because you're a team. Uh, there is someone that, that, uh, uh, whom you can trust, who, got, who, who has got your back. And uh, it just, uh, for me, it like boosts my productivity and boosts my possibilities by like a thousand percent, you know? So I'm like with Monica, I'm like, yeah, like, let's do it. Let's do it tomorrow. I'm not afraid. I'm not even that double thinking, you know, no doubts. I can just go. <laughs> so, so what's next? Like, what's the next thing, like the literal next thing that you guys are doing together? Uh, actually, next week, uh, so I'm not sure when this is uh, going uh, live, <laughs> but next week, so uh, the 23rd September, we are uh, performing in the opening event uh, of uh, European uh, Capital for Culture. Uh, and it's happening in my hometown because my hometown becomes this capital, capital for culture this uh, next year. And, uh, and yes, we are trying to bring this uh, Piano Face project to, to Europe. We want to travel uh, through museums with this project. Uh, probably we go to London. This is our, our closest goal. And uh, yes, you can support our journey <laughs> by visiting the, the page uh, Anna mentioned. And uh, of course, you know, watch documentary and uh, I really I, I really hope that you will get inspired because I get inspired when I watch it <laughs> I think that the whole point or the whole idea about having I, I always call it a cohort in crime just to make it like a fun negative sounding thing um, but having that other person to share your passion with is it's like job zero. Like, I mean, you can, you can be really bad at something, but if you find somebody else who is on the same journey with you, then that, like you said, Anna, that's a huge multiplier. Um, there's an aspect to, so in, I, I believe it's in all performance artwork, but in podcasting in particular, all the podcasters have imposter syndrome. And I think the, the cure for imposter syndrome is like the 15,000th time that you say to that passionate person, I'm not sure about this. And they go, are you crazy? That's awesome. Like that other person saying that that's like the cure. That's, that's your, it's really hard to get out of your head and to not, you know, have the same thoughts go around or like, well, how do I really know that this is any good? But having that other person say, yeah, that's, that's better than good. Let's do more of that. Um, I think that's a great takeaway. I think more people, people listening, more podcasters, um, should find someone, even if it's just to have a zoom call, you know, and chew the fat as we say, um, and, you know, we are tribal uh, creatures at the end of the day. So I think mm -hmm. being in a, in a sort of tribe for, well, maybe not all of the humans, but 99.9% .9 of us <laughs> is just, it's just better. You know, you will always find yes, an old so person sure. who just prefers a dungeon on their own. But for <laughs> most of us, it's just easier to be in a team. Right. Yes. All right, ladies, I think um, that's a good place to call it <clears throat> a session. And like I said, I say to everybody, we can do more of these. We can do them again. Um, <laughs> so uh, thank you very much for taking the time to hop on a call and talk to me. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you very much for having us. <laughs>
Bye. 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 <laughs> <laughs> <I mean, laughs>